Good morning. Welcome to Tuesday Morning Chapel. Thank you so much to Jackson and Debbie and Sister Daniela for the wonderful and beautiful song service. Now is the time that we are going to have another powerful presentation from Pastor Grams. Last, na uh, last, the last day, like yesterday, we talked about A.T. Jones, and today we are going to review the history of one of the most eloquent speakers that has ever been seen in the history of Seventh-day Adventists, and that is D.M. Canwright. So I want to welcome Pastor Graham to come up front and he will lead us in the opening prayer. And I also want to welcome those who have joined us online, that we are really happy that you can join in sharing these blessings from Heartland College through watching online. So thank you so much and God bless you. So we open the meeting with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this wonderful privilege of studying to show ourselves approved unto God so that we might not be ashamed. In Jesus' name, we thank thee for your spirit. Amen. Today they, uh, well, they want to give me my materials here. I, 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 I could stay tethered, you know, very close, but uh, I'll just take these. This will give me an opportunity to walk around a little bit. Welcome to all of you, those of you who are watching, as well as those who are here in person. Who was it that I talked about yesterday? Jones. Oh, A.T. Jones. You know, there's something about A.T. Jones that I didn't tell you yesterday. So I am today. The reason that you enjoy the liberty that you do could largely be attributed to A.T. Jones because almost single-handedly, he took on the National Sunday Law that uh, uh, was trying to invade our country. It was uh, proposed by one Senator Blair. And uh, actually he had to bring it up twice. His first one was just so harsh uh, that uh, Jones was able to completely derail it. The second Sunday law that he proposed, Senator Blair, this Sunday law was a little more nuanced and, and soft and even provided a curious exemption for people like Seventh-day Adventists. But of course, the language was a bit hypocritical at best, and that was exposed also by A.T. Jones. And so, by God's amazing grace, the effort to have a national Sunday law was aborted. And uh, that was a good abortion. That was a really good one. And uh, thankfully, we've lived under the blossoming fragrance of a flower of full religious freedom since that time. There's another little interesting aspect, though, about A.T. Jones with this. You know, of these the Sunday laws came at about the same time as the Minneapolis meeting. Now that's interesting, because the brethren had their dukes up, and we're going to fight it out over the law, over the ten toes, over um, or the ten horns, over many things that seem to come to the front there in uh, Minneapolis. What is the law of Galatians? What is the role of righteousness by faith as compared to keeping the commandments? And people were really incensed about it. And I believe it was at that meeting that one newspaper person who was uh, observing our Adventist meetings, he said these Adventists go at all their uh, doctrinal differences like... Uh, fella trying to chop some wood furiously. 
he really, we really went at it uh, with great vehemence. But you know, the sad part is that Ellen White saw in vision what was happening, really. And many of the brethren in their rooms at Minneapolis, at night in their rooms, would make fun of other brethren. And she saw that in vision. How about us today? You know, do we unnecessarily marginalize those who view aspects of Adventism different than we do? It's an interesting thought because uh, we haven't outgrown that tendency even now. But even with all these differences, there was one thing that everybody agreed on, and that was Senator Blair's bill has to go. And they put up a united front against what was happening and got more signatures than you can even imagine. The numbers were in the multi-thousands to stop this Sunday law. And all the brethren agreed. All the brethren and sisters agreed. Now I have a question. And then we must move on to Dudley Canwright. What if a Senator Blair showed up today in the United States Senate. We have some very interesting insights on that. There are many in the United States Senate today who believe in Reconstructionism and the Seven Mountains and so forth. And these are all theories that have been imbibed by a great many of our leaders in Congress. And what would happen today if there was actual Sunday law proposed by one of them? Because were I to go through their um, doctrines with you, you could see that they're all set up to make a Sunday law. Would we have the unifying response that they had in 1888? in 1889? Or would we be confused? The reason I ask that is because it's hard even, and I have to leave this with you because the United States affects everything. It's hard for some Seventh-day Adventists to separate their politics from their religion. And so they find themselves unconsciously becoming more attuned to certain political wings rather than the higher principles of Adventism and religious liberty. And uh, I've seen that, and it just makes my teeth chatter. It's just unbelievable, because with that kind of an attitude, we are preparing to support someone like Senator Blair instead of challenging him. So I'd appeal to you to reread Great Controversy again. It's a great old book. Ask a canvasser. You, he can get, you can get a copy. And in the book, toward the end, it says exactly how we're going to lose our freedoms. And it's going to come through things like Reconstructionism and um, the teachings of John Rush Dooney and others. And most people are totally unaware of that. And that's what many American politicians are proposing today. So I just pray that you study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Now, we're going to move into Dudley Canwright, lest I embarrass Enos, who's announced that's what I was going to talk about today. So, I'm going to begin with a text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Actually, I'm going to go to verse 11, and I'm going to watch all of you turn to it, 
And not one of you has a funny look on your face. You know what I just did? Oh, this is so good. I just gave you the very same text that I gave you yesterday morning. And you all smiled sweetly. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, try it again someday. Because uh, we have a theme going already. And that is, well, it's stated here. Look at verse 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages or the end of the world have come. Now, I didn't read verse 11 yesterday. I only read verse 12. But verse 11 gives you the context. Let's go to verse 12. Verse 12. Now, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he... Fall. Here's the context of it. The Exodus. When you study the Exodus, you'll find that it is the seminal historical event in the Old Testament that the New Testament refers to when instructing you in the ways of righteousness. The Exodus becomes a model. And what is the Exodus? It's the journey from Egypt to Canaan. You're on that journey. And the lessons that you can learn from the original journey are totally applicable for our journey. And that's why, a little more history here, some other names. Uh, It didn't make it onto the internet, but I said that these names I gave are just introductory There'll be other names. I kind of gave that idea. And one of the other names is Taylor Bunch, a well-known Adventist scholar, writer, and preacher. And and he gave a series of lectures at the Battle Creek Tabernacle in the 1930s, our most famous Seventh-day Adventist church. And in those series of lectures, he, he put them together into booklet form and entitled it The Exodus in Type and Antitype. The type is the Old Testament story. The antitype is you going from Egypt to where? Canaan. So this Exodus story is wonderfully applicable for us. As I've stated, the concept of the Exodus is referred to by other writers. Even the Psalms refer to the concept of the Exodus and the instructive nature of it. Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. And you begin to to understand that if we could grasp the, the story of the Exodus, we would be prepared to journey safely home to glory. So with that in mind... We, we, we turn now to our friend D.M. Canry. We'll leave the halls of justice. And uh, in the United States, we'll leave A.T. Jones and religious liberty. And we'll talk about D.M. Canry now. Because this same text, beware lest you fall thinking that you're strong and standing. This text is equally applicable to D.M. Canfrey. He was about 19 years old when uh, he became a Seventh-day Adventist. A nice, fine, young man. He became so good at what he did that he actually was able to lose James White's James, the gift that James White had given him. And what had James White given him? Well, when, when Ken Wright was young, Elder White, that's right, Ellen White's husband, had a, some charts, prophetic charts. And he grabbed those prophetic charts and a Bible. And he walked over to Dudley Ken Wright and he said, okay, Dudley, 
prove your stuff. Here it is. If you don't make it in sharing these things, that's all right. Just bring them back to me. And a year later, they were at a meeting. I think it was about a year. And uh, Elder White said, say, how about all that material I gave you? And Ken Reich said, you lost them. You're not, in other words, they're not coming back. And of course, it was in the context of meaning that he had used them most successfully. And thus launched Dudley Canwright's incredible career as one of the top three officers of the General Conference and an incredibly eloquent speaker. Dudley Canwright was so good at speaking that when he went to the Chicago School, one of the most eminent schools in the country of elocution, he was having a little bit of voice problem, so he wrote to Ellen White and said, I think they can help me with my voice, too. And um, he went there, and I guess it was part of his assignment. He spoke at one of the large churches in Chicago. And one of our other brethren was there. And Elder Kenwright, by this time he was a well-known preacher and elder, he asked this other Adventist minister to take notes and to give him a critique at the end of his talk. I think there were about 3,000 people there, and they came and they listened because he was representing this school of elocution at that point, and he gave a wonderful Adventist sermon, so powerful that this elder who was supposed to write a rebuttal just kind of, he forgot to write anything. It was unbelievable. In fact, so unbelievable that after Canwright gave his speech, people crowded around him so much that you couldn't even get close for a long time. It was just an incredible story, experience. So finally the people disperse, and this elder and Canwright are sitting alone. And they're thinking about it. I think they had walked to a park in Chicago or something, and and um, they're sitting there. Kenwright suddenly jumps up. And he says, you know what? I could have been a great man if it wasn't for the unpopular message that we have. Well, the brother was just stunned. Kenwright just had just stated if it wasn't for this Adventist, unpopular message, look at who I could be. Now, we can't say that's the genesis of that kind of thinking. But Kenwright began to hold on to that idea more and more until finally he publicly disavowed his association with the Seventh-day Adventist church. He publicly joined another denomination. He said, I'll always be friends. And then he publicly started to write against those who had helped him so much. James White had been the person who was the minister for Dudley Canwright's second marriage. His first wife had died. And he was so close to the Whites and he looked at Mr. and Mrs. White, you know, Ellen and James, you know, almost like parents. And, and James White married them. And his new wife, Dudley Canwright's new wife, said, oh, I'm so grateful for what you've done for us, Elder White. And she wrote him the most wonderful letter. She says, I, I think of you as a father. She was only 25. Canwright was 40 at the time they got married. And yet this man disavowed it all and then started writing against us. In fact, he wrote about a 400 and some page book that became so famous that people probably still refer to it today. It's entitled Seventh Day Adventism Renounced. And in that book, he blasted everything that he had ever believed in. It's a, it's a tragic tale. 
It's unbelievably tragic. And yet he knew what he was doing. And at Ellen White's funeral, he went by, I think, three or four times her coffin. He was just dumbstruck because he realized, as he stated, that he had grieved the Holy Spirit until he felt there was absolutely no hope for him. He knew in private He'd still have conversations with our Adventist leaders. He knew he was wrong. We know many of his deepest feelings because Carrie Johnson, when she was studying at an advanced school in shorthand and things like this, she said the the, uh, director of the school said, I want you to take this job. And it was a very highfalutin job And uh, she felt very honored. He wouldn't tell her who she was going to be transcribing for. But it turned out to be D.M. Canwright. And Carrie Johnson wrote this incredible book called I Was Canwright's Secretary. And there you get into the mind of a man who would blurt out all these horrible things against Adventists and then say, you know, privately, you know, No, it's not true. Don't believe a word of it. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But one day, a lady went to the door, and there was this old gentleman trying to sell a little book. I think it was by J.E. White, James Edson White. And she somehow they got to conversation. She found out, oh, you're Dudley Canright. And here he was in the, at the end of his life selling an Adventist book. And yet his book, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced, was going all over. And publicly, he was a defamer of Seventh-day Adventists. Unbelievable what goes on behind the scenes. If I was you, I'd de- I would ask God to help you to take heed lest you fall. That you be strong, because this message is what made Canwright what he was. Not that he was intrinsically a great speaker. What gave him power at that church in Chicago that just enthralled 3,000 people was the simple fact that he was preaching an Adventist message. The story sort of goes a little wider, Some think it's possible that one of D.M. Canwright's teachers of elocution was none other than, are you ready for this? Moses Hall. How many of you know about Moses Hall? Raise your hands to the sky. Oh, our professor knows, and Kulo knows. Yeah. Moses Hall is another D.M. Canwright with just a little bit of varying shade. Moses Hall was so eloquent, he could take on spiritualists even directly and debate them. And he finally came to the place where he thought, I'm a pretty good guy. I can beat these spiritualists. Ellen White says, be careful. So did others. And Moses Hall the greatest exponent against spiritualists, ended up joining the spiritualists. He became so famous as a spiritualist that I have here in an encyclopedia, Moses Hall, a prominent American spiritualist lecturer and teacher. That's how he's primarily remembered. Then you go into it, oh, He was a Seventh-day Adventist. And then it gets more complicated. You think spiritualists are those who sit around a table that levitates and go spooky, 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 and all this. No! Spiritualists, Moses Hull became a Bible-using spiritualist. 
This is unbelievable. I, I've got to read you something so you don't think. He used the Bible and placed it in spiritualist context. Talk about deception. And he founded a school. This is unbelievable. The Morris Pratt Institute. Well, he actually um, he opened this school up, and the institute survived his passing. He died in 1906, and is now the educational arm of the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, founded by no other than an Adventist preacher. So take heed, those of you who think you're so strong here at Heartland. Think you never change. Think nothing could touch you. Take heed, lest you fall. We only have one person to really trust, and that's who? Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father. In these tumultuous days, may we, by the grace of our living Lord, Jesus Christ, respond in faith day by day to your wondrous and kind and gracious leading. Thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Graham, for that wonderful presentation. Well, we really have a lot to learn from the history, right? And you know, we don't need to wait and experience such things to learn from them. But I think God has allowed this history to reach us so that we can learn from others' experience and we may be aware of the danger of falling in the same. And that calls for a humility and close work with Jesus daily. Thank you so much, Pastor Grams, and I want to thank those who have been uh, able to join us online. We just want to say thank you so much, and we hope that you can join us tomorrow. And please, if it is your first time joining us here at Heartland College, uh, we ask you to uh, subscribe, like, and share the content that it may be a blessing to you as well as to your friends. And thank you so much, and have a wonderful day.